Special relativity comes from one central observation, that the speed of light is the same for all observers. This is counterintuitive. For example, if a person turns on a flashlight, everyone would agree that the speed of light from this flashlight is c. However, if the person starts running, shouldn't the speed of light from the flashlight be higher than c? This intuition is incorrect. The physicists made a lot of experiments and concluded that the speed of light is the same for all observers, whether they are moving or not, and whether the source of light is moving or not. In this video, I'll use this fact to explain time dilation, relativity of simultaneity, and length contraction. Let's start with a person riding on a train. The person sits perpendicular to the motion of the train with a mirror in front of her. She makes a short flash of light, which goes to the mirror, reflects, and returns to her. She measures the time it takes light to go to the mirror and back. And because she knows the distance to the mirror, she calculates the speed of light. She happily concludes that it is c. Imagine that you're riding on a train moving very fast in the opposite direction. You know that between making a light flash and recording its return, the train with the lady moved, and so light moves along sides of a triangle. If we were in the times before Einstein, we would say that because sides of the triangle are longer than its height, the light has a longer distance to cover for you than for her, and so the speed of light must be higher for you than for her. But this is incorrect. We know that the speed of light must be c for you as well. So, what can we do to make it c? First, we can say that the distance light travels in both cases is the same. This means that for you, her train is squeezed so that a side of the triangle as you measure it is the same as the height of the triangle as she measures it. Then, both for you and her, the light covers the same distance in the same time, and so for both of you the speed of light is c. An alternative explanation is that the time goes faster for you than for her. This would mean that for you more time has passed between the departure and the return of the light beam. The light beam has to cover a longer distance, but also has more time to do so, and again, the speed of light is c for both of you. So, which of these two explanations is correct? For many reasons, the first one is wrong. First of all, the physicists do not observe that the space gets squeezed in this way, but it can also be rejected because it leads to many paradoxes. For example, imagine that there is a train and a tunnel of similar width. If you speed up the train near the speed of light to the train passenger, the tunnel should be narrower, and there should be a crash. But for a person standing next to the tunnel, the train is narrower, so there should be no crash. In reality, only one of those two can be true. So, the only possible solution is that the clocks on the train with the lady go slower than the clocks on the train with you, giving light more time to cover longer distance, and so the speed of light is the same for everybody. Also, as she approaches the speed of light, the sides of the triangle go to infinity, and so her clock slows down to zero. And how could you verify experimentally that her clock is ticking slower? To do that, synchronize two clocks on board of your train. Tell two of your friends to read time off of her clock when she passes by. Make sure that the distance between her clock and your friends is small enough so that you can neglect the time light will need to travel between them. Then, as she moves, you will see that more time has passed according to your clocks than according to hers. Of course, we could carry out exactly the same reasoning in which you and she switch places. So from her point of view, your clocks tick slower than hers. 
Surprisingly, there is no paradox here, because her clocks do not appear synchronized to you due to relativity of simultaneity, which we will discuss shortly. To sum up, for any observer, clocks that are moving relative to this observer tick slower than his clock. This is the phenomenon called time dilation. Now, imagine that you have two trains of exactly the same length. These are cargo trains with empty platforms so that everybody can see what's going on inside them. Each train has two lamps at its ends. Also, each train has two sensors at the ends. When the corresponding sensors are close to each other, the adjacent lamps make a quick flash of light. Moreover, along each train there are light sensors connected to firecrackers. If light from the lamps comes to a sensor from both sides simultaneously, the nearby firecracker goes off. Obviously, when the two trains stand still next to each other, the light rays emitted by the lamps will meet exactly in the middle of each train, and this is where the explosion occurs. Let the two trains move in the opposite directions with a speed close to the speed of light. You observe them as they get closer. Eventually, they are next to each other right in front of you. You observe that in both trains, the front and the rear lamps make a flash of light at the same time. The light beams travel while the trains move beneath them and meet right in front of you. So the sensors which receive the two pulses of light at the same time are at the back of each train. The firecracker explosion occurs not in the middle of the train, but closer to its back. This is exactly what a person riding on a train sees. The firecracker explosion occurred towards the back of the train, but the firecracker was activated by a sensor receiving two light beams simultaneously. The light beam from the front of the train had a longer path than the light beam from the rear of the train. And since the speed of both light beams was the same, the front lamp must have flashed earlier than the rear lamp. As a result, an outside observer concludes that all lamps flashed simultaneously. A person in the train moving to the left concludes that the lamps on the left flashed first. A person in the train moving to the right concludes that the lamps on the right flashed first. Clocks synchronized for one observer are not synchronized for others. This is not a paradox. This is a feature of special relativity. In fact, for any two events that happen simultaneously according to one observer, you can find another observer for whom the events happen in any order you want. This is called relativity of simultaneity. Let's go back to the passenger who sees the firecracker explode close to the rear of the train and who concludes that the front lamp must have gone off earlier than the rear lamp. This implies that there must have been a situation in which the front of his train was adjacent to the rear of the other train, but the other ends of the trains were not yet close to each other. Then, some time passed, the other ends of trains met, and the rear light was emitted. So the other train must be shorter. Also, as the speed of the other train approaches the speed of light, the firecracker explodes closer to the back. In such situation, the length of the other train approaches zero. Of course, we could carry out the same reasoning for the passenger of the other train. So from his point of view, our train is shorter than his. In fact, for any observer, moving objects are shorter in the direction of movement. This is called length contraction. So, why don't we see these effects around? It's because these effects are very small for the speeds we experience in everyday life. Due to special relativity, a typical airplane at a cruising speed gets shortened by 0.000000000035% and the clocks on it tick the same percentage slower. However, 
Both time dilation and length contraction have been extensively studied experimentally and physicists conclude that they do in fact exist. If you want to know an example of how special relativity affects everyday objects, you can watch my video on why magnets attract each other. And in case you're interested, here are the formulas I used. Thanks for watching.